Well, so yeah, I was, uh, I was involved in Java generics for a while there back then. I think some people blame me for wildcards, um, which may have been why um, Microsoft hired me. You know, he's, he's good at, uh, as, at uh, um, ruining the story for the Java guys. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but I've bettered my ways. I now work on the C-sharp language at Microsoft. Um, these are great times to be um, in that position because uh, stuff is just um, going pretty crazy around C-sharp and .NET right now. Uh, we have um, the, the thing that's sort of at the core of my talk today is what we call Project Roslyn for no particular reason other than it's named after a, a little town in, uh, in central Washington state. Um, which is sort of a, a completely re-implemented language engine, if you will, for uh, C-sharp and also for Visual Basic. Um, so you can just sort of generically apply and for Visual Basic wherever appropriate in the rest of this talk, and I won't mention it again. Um, uh, a language engine that is, yes, a compiler, but also uh, the language service for uh, IDE support, um, working in a sort of mostly tool agnostic way to serve up um, information about the language in real time, and also a, um, a driver for any kind of static analysis you want to do over the language. Something that understands source code and produces source code with extremely high fidelity. That's, that's the core of that project. And when we've then sort of been, going to rebuild all our tooling for C Sharp on top of that. Um, and so we're going to be playing with what that means um, during this talk. We're also open source. About a year ago, we took uh, the uh, C Sharp compiler open source on CodePlex. And then a couple of months ago in January, we moved to GitHub because um, Otherwise, you're not really open source, apparently. Um, <laughs> there's a whole lot more uh, fun going on there. Uh, we also um, recently open sourced what we call .NET Core. It's sort of the modern componentized version of .NET um, that is uh, now completely open source and um, maybe not completely done, but at least uh, uh, the work is going out, uh, out there on, on GitHub uh, for a, a CLR that, is, um, that uh, can run on much a smaller footprint because it's uh, well componentized, then that um, is uh, cross-platform. So it will run on Linux and Mac as well. Um, and so with .NET um, going cross-platform in Angular, um, being able to, uh, for instance, run in all the different kinds of VMs that we uh, offer up in Azure or whatever, it, that's really important for us. Um, it also means that we can now consider um, having cross-platform tooling support as well. Um, and again, the, the, the Roslyn um, language engine plays a core part in that, in how would you do, how would you do uh, C Sharp, um, have a great C Sharp editing experience from some tool on, let's say Sublime Text or whatever. Well, there's an answer for that because of, because of this infrastructure. And we actually have our own Visual Studio Code lightweight editor that we just released that is on, um, across these, uh, these three platforms in particular right now. Um, there's an, uh, an, another open project going on called OmniSharp, which um, actually, again, benefits from having a core uh, language engine written in C-sharp, putting, um, putting a layer around it, making it essentially a standalone language server, if you will, that you can run on your machine and talk to via protocol to get completion events and other kinds of things from IDEs, so that rather than having to do a completely new a, a deep integration of, of language understanding into your IDE. You just have this sort of loosely coupled, you just need a little thing that can talk to the language server. Uh, and so we're hoping to see C Sharp start showing up in many more IDEs over the next year or so. So um, if C Sharp wasn't for you a year ago, it may be now. Um, if it isn't now, it may be a year from now. Um, we're definitely looking at going out in a lot more places and a lot higher quality of the development experience um, at all levels. Um, we're also doing a lot of our design now completely in the open. It used to be that we sat around, as, as Gilad Bracha used to say, in smoke-filled rooms and planned the future of C-sharp. And someday, uh, two years later, we would come out at a big conference and say, ta-da, here here's the word, here's what we're doing. And people would say, oh, wish, wish they'd ask us before. They didn't usually say that. But um, we, we just totally opened that process up. We're, we're still designing, we're still planning, even as a, as version C Sharp 6 is coming out now uh, in the next couple of months, uh, we're already designing on C Sharp 7, but we're doing it completely in the open. We're putting design notes out, we're taking proposals on GitHub, uh, lots of discussion, lots of, uh, of feedback. Um, so um, it's a nice, nice open cross-platform world to be in. 
But that's sort of the context. Uh, I want to start focusing in on the Roslyn engine itself. Um, so it works both as a batch compiler. It'll generate IL. Um, um, and it, it's also, at the same time, the driver for the IDE. So a big challenge here for us is uh, that there's sort of conflicting um, uh, pressures on a language engine for those two purposes. Uh, for batch compilation, you want to focus on throughput, uh, correctness. Uh, you want to produce you know, uh, great executable code based on correct programs. And that's, that's the main, and you want to do that fast, right? So that's the main pressure on there. Whereas in, in an IDE, you want to be responsive. Uh, you want to have great error recovery, so you want to be able to deal. When somebody is typing in an IDE, the code is wrong most of the time, and you want to be able to deal with that in a graceful manner. Right? It's only like a fraction of the time that they actually happen to have a, um, a well-formed syntax tree. So uh, we've, uh, we've really sort of um, taken those pressures and, and pushed on both, insisting that we wanted the language understanding to be implemented only once. You can't have, if you have separate implementations for different purposes, they will drift apart, they won't be uh, uh, to full quality. So we've insisted on having it in one place. And I'll show you some of, some of why. Um, actually, this ne next point uh, speaks to it. Um, at the core of Roslyn is an object model of code. There's an API okay, that represents source code. Um, so uh, syntax trees, fully concrete syntax trees, all the way down to the individual tokens and white space and so on, uh, represented as data structures in a public API that anyone can access. Right, and target at source code in the tool or as a standalone analysis uh, process or whatever. Um, you can also get a semantic information, all kinds of binding information and all that. In, um, in, in an API that's completely immutable, okay? So we present all th these vast trees are immutable and we use it, all the tricks in the book for working with immutable data types, um, including lots of sharing and, in, and incremental um, uh, modification, non-destructive modification, creating new trees out of old ones by reusing, you know, 99% uh, of, of the subtrees, um, and, uh, and uh, at the same time also using laziness and other techniques and so on. So, so we've done all the work to make these very efficient data structures to work with for anyone else, um, uh, both if you're using them in batch mode and, and in sort of um, an interactive mode as part of a tooling experience. Um, and again, yes, it's open source. We take contributions on GitHub. Come and visit us on uh, uh, github.com slash .net slash Roslyn and, um, and uh, pitch in there. So I'm not really, uh, I don't have a lot of slides. Um, I'm more sort of a coding live and possibly crash and burn kind of guy. Um, so uh, today, I'm gonna, in a minute, I'm going to switch over and we're going to spend essentially the rest of our time together in Visual Studio. Um, and, um, and uh, I'll show you some things, and we can, we can uh, take it from there, all right? So what we're going to look at is, I'm going to walk over here because I forgot my watch. What we're going to look at is uh, some new language features that we kind of had time to build in between building this, all this infrastructure. And they're kind of fun, um, maybe a little lightweight. Uh, it's definitely, C Sharp 6 is not one of those releases to revolutionize the world. It's essentially about cleaning up your code and getting rid of some, of some boilerplate, making your C-sharp code more concise. And I'm going to show some examples of that. It's not going to be a thorough breakdown of everything that's going on. I'll point you to where you can find that online if you want to. Um, we're going to also see how Roslyn plays in the IDE, how you can build your own analyzers, make them work in the IDE, uh, uh, some improvements to the debugging experience. And then we'll go and build our own analyzer based on the Roslyn API, and, and just, uh, just to feel that sort of easy extensibility um, of uh, sort of language-based uh, analysis that, that anyone can go build. And uh, time permitting, at the end, we can look a little bit at what's going on with C-sharp 7, what are our initial thoughts on that. Um, but if we don't get to it, um, you know, track me down, um, hunt me down, wrestle me to the floor at the party tonight, and ask me until I, you know, I promise you to, uh, to put in your favorite feature. Um, and this we'll talk about later. That was exactly the kind of thing that I, I didn't want to get to yet. Um, so uh, let's go to Visual Studio. Without further ado, this is the release candidate of Visual Studio. Um, that was just Visual Studio 2015. It was just released. You can go download it. It's free. It's going to stay free if you're uh, not in an enterprise. Uh, it's community edition. Uh, so you can go play with this um, at essentially release quality right now. So um, here we are in just some sample, uh, sample program in the new uh, in the new C-sharp IDE, and, 
And millennials become the biggest generation in the US workforce. I should have turned that off, probably. Um, I had such lousy internet here before, but now it seems to be doing fine. Uh, so um, uh, one of the, let's start with, um, with uh, one of the um, language features that uh, Java has had for a long time that we've stole, because uh, um, you know, uh, we like to respond in kind to um, some, of the some of the transgressions that have happened in the past. So you can now, in, in C Sharp, you also now have a using static that can put static members of a type into scope. Um, so we'll, we'll do, let's say, system.math, which is a s standard library of, of static functions doing math. And you'll see it's grayed out here because the language engine knows that you're not using, uh, making use of it anywhere. Um, so you can, and you can see down here now the math.square root here has, has become grayed out as well because, um, well, um, you don't actually have to say it anymore. So now if I, if I hit control dot, you can see there's a light bulb out there. If I hit control dot, I get one of the, the built-in um, fixes suggested to me, which is, you know, simplify it. It shows a before and after. Um, good, solid IDE behavior here. Certainly better than what Visual Studio users are used to, maybe users of other tools. Um, don't, aren't really impressed by this, and that's okay. Um, uh, still a lot of people um, that, are, that are happy. But this is built-in behavior, and, and kind of what I want to point out in a minute is this, is this built-in behavior is built on those same APIs that we're going to go and build on in a minute, and I'll show you some custom-built analyzers and fixes uh, in a minute that have the same behavior and distinguishable. You can essentially plug into the IDE um, Visual Studio or any other IDE that will support this. Okay, so that was... Um, that was the first little language feature there. Um, let's just also go, let's do it again uh, with uh, system.console. I believe in Java, it's, are there any Java programmers in here? Did they all leave the room? Wow, okay, that's a few, good. Because I'm, I'm, um, I'm operating under the assumption that it's not all just C-sharp folks. Uh, though it seems to almost be. Who's not a C-sharp developer in here? Oh, good, thank you, great, almost half. I was worried there for a second. Um, um, there's a program here that has a bunch of occurrences of console to write line. There's also this ability to go and say, well, um, fix all of them in the document. You get a nice preview, uh, shows all four. I can turn them on or off, apply after the preview, and boom. OK. Nice built-in behavior. Um, now, um, let's go look at... Um, these, um, we have these short little methods and properties here. Here's a method uh, that returns the two string. It's an implementation of two string. Here's a property, a computed property with a getter that returns some stuff. And you'll see that stuff here is grayed out as well. Well, that is not the, that's not Visual Studio itself graying out these things. That is a, a user built plugin saying, you don't need this. Um, consider using an expression bodied member. So, what I have is I installed a little extension that will suggest use of the new language features to me. So whenever you can use one of the new language features, it'll suggest to do so because it's probably going to make your code nicer. So I'm going to say, OK, it looks like there's a light bulb. It may even want to fix it for me. Use expression bodied member, it says. Oh, sure, let me go do that. That's a nice preview. That looks good. Um, and that's the bug that it jumps there has been fixed, by the way. Um, uh, oh, I did it on this one down here instead. Uh, never mind, that's a property. Same idea. Um, so it fixes to this uh, new shorter syntax here, which uses a, what we should probably call a function error, a proper function error with an equal sign, not, a, not that little skinny minus there that some other languages have for their lambdas, um, uh, to say, um, you know, why, why, why provide a whole statement body for, for the simple uh, um, method or the simple property when you can just put the expression? After all, lambdas allow expressions at the bodies as well, right? Do they in Java? Or do lambdas have, they have to have statement bodies? Oh, poor you, poor you. Oh, well, here's an idea for you. Um, allow it on, uh, <laughs> allow it on, uh, on uh, function members too. So, um, so, this, so this whole behavior, the, the preview and everything was computed from something that the built in, or that the not built in, but that just one of my colleagues built and uploaded as an extension. Um, analyzer and fix, uh, um, you know, just provided by those. Um, so we can go, you can see you can do the same for these operator overloads here, um, which I also don't have in Java. Um, and we can, we can just, oh, hang on. Um, we can just go and um, do them all. And 
in one fell swoop here. And the, the whole point, again, is uh, well, don't, don't, have, uh, don't, don't have so much boilerplate lying around. Just, uh, just write your code concisely. When it's, when it's simple, make that stand out. So, so that's the point of the language. I'm kind of intermixing language and ID features here just for, uh, to make you uh, completely confused. Um, so that's that. Um, let's look at, so that was also, so that's an example of some, um, um, some analyzers that showed a problem or a suggestion with the code and then there was a fix for it. Um, there's also, you can also build your own refactorings. So C Sharp now actually does have a significant number of refactorings as opposed to like two or something. Um, but you can also build your own. So if you look at string.format here, it's, it's not marked in any way, but if I go there and ask, hey, what can I do here? It's going to suggest that, well, uh, you can expand that expression bodied member right back out if you want to, but you can also convert to an interpolated string. So interpolated strings, people might know from other languages, it's the idea that you don't need to do a gnarly library call in order to have your code formatted. This is actually sort of built-in syntax for it in the language. And we have that too here. String out format in .NET, you have to put these numbers and curlies inside of the format string, and they refer to positions of the subsequent arguments. And that's just a pain. You, you add one, and you remove one, and you move it around in the string, and all of a sudden, it's all out of alignment, and you're full of bugs. Um, so why not, uh, why not turn this into, um, um, why not uh, take and, and choose that one? Oh, that was the wrong one. Um, and choose to convert to interpolate a string, and it'll use the syntax here, where you put a dollar in front of a string, and that turns things with curlies into real holes that you can put expressions in, and they will just get formatted right into place there. Um, and so string formatting becomes a lot more concise in the language. Um, there are also hidden tricks that I'm not going to show you. If you don't like the, the formatting to current culture that is default here, there are hidden tricks that you can do it differently, but I don't want to show those. Um, so yet another little language feature. Um, let's get to some of the maybe slightly more interesting ones. Actually, let me, you know, most IDEs nowadays have a, have a good uh, inline rename refactoring, and we have one as well now. Um, hit F2 there on a name, and you, and you get an inline rename, rename experience. Of course, if I rename to, just to show you how deeply this engine understands the language, if you rename to a keyword, it will escape the keyword. It will resolve the conflict for you, essentially. If you rename to, um, uh, let's say, Y, it'll tell you that here's a conflict I can't resolve and give you, give you uh, red everywhere. Let's, um, let's see. If, we, if I rename it, to, let's actually, uh, hang on a second. Um, let's expand this constructor here. If I rename it to, say, uh, lowercase x, you'll see that down in the constructor, it'll automatically resolve the conflict between the, the two lowercase x's uh, by putting a this dot in front. So we essentially have a mechanism in there that takes any, any piece of code that may be affected, expands it to the most elaborated syntax that will get the right answer, and then removes everything that can be removed without changing its meaning. And we use that in refactoring support automatically to, um, to fix up conflicts whenever we can to the shortest possible way of, ex of expressing the meaning of what was there before, even if the thing there no longer means that, so that you can trust your refactorings and, um, and don't have to kind of double check yourself all the time. OK. Um, now for some fun stuff, maybe. Um, here is a method that takes this point class that I have and turns, or takes a JSON object and, and turns it into point. Um, so first it checks. Is it, um, is it actually in the right shape? Then if it's not, it, it throws an, um, an exception here. And if it is, it turns it into a point by creating a new one here. So um, uh, you see that there's a squiggle here because, um, again, my plugged in thing is giving me a warning saying, this is probably wrong because you have a string of the same name as an argument that you, that you took in. Um, so uh, if, if someone was to go and use the, the fancy new uh, inline rename on the argument, well, uh, that name down here wouldn't automatically follow. You'd have to remember to include strings, and you might forget. And so refactoring where there are string representations of program names around is a dangerous business. And we figured it was best to uh, address this in the language. So there's actually here a, um, a refactoring to use a new name of feature, which is just essentially um, pass any named entity from the language and get the string out um, 
I'll resolve that compile time, of course, just to a string, um, so that uh, you know if you go and, and do a rename now, it, it works across uh, this guy as well here. If you if you um, change the name to something that isn't allowed, you get an error and so on. So. More annoyingly, I have this lump of code up here to check, is the JSON in the right shape? First of all, you know, is it null? If, if, if I index into the X, which is how the, the, the J object uh, API works, uh, is that null? Was it there or not? And then if it was, is its type, um, uh, is, is it an integer? Okay, so it's all this null checking. And null checking is everywhere and it's really annoying and when it's not everywhere, it's because you forgot to put it in and you have bugs. Um, so we wanted to make it a little easier with um, what is sometimes known as the uh, Elvis operator. Um, question dot, you know, the two eyes and this, this swoop of hair, so it's Elvis. Um, uh, we call it the null conditional operator, um, which will, is a dot that will check first if the thing on the left is null, and if it is, then the whole thing becomes null, and otherwise, uh, you do the dot and get the value out, okay? So it kind of, it's null propagating, if you will. Um, if there's null on the left-hand side, the thing on the right-hand side become null instead of throwing an exception. And so, of course, null is not equal to jtokenType.integer, so in this case, we can just go and remove the explicit null check here. Use question dot instead. Do that here as well. And actually, you can do it for indexing as well. So uh, I, can put a question, um, I can put a question mark here and that means only do the indexing if JSON wasn't null. And so um, I can actually re um, remove all these null checks here and just sort of have the essence of the code stand out. I'm saying if the um, JSON object doesn't have an X and a Y of type integer, throw this exception. And that's all it kind of says now, okay? So um, that is pretty much all I'm going to show you about C sharp six. There are more features. They have that same kind of flavor of little things, but hopefully your code looks nicer after you applied them. Um, and uh, then, unless you have some quick questions you want to throw in there, um, any quick questions? Yeah. Yeah. The rename. Uh, if you rename, will the rename example binding? Um, I think that the SAML binding. I think that doesn't completely work yet. We're working on it. Um, that's. That's a place where they, they don't necessarily, we, we don't necessarily talk to each other at the right point. So that is where a name shows up in, in markup. Um, uh, but now at least we have the foundations in place to be able to do it. So okay. hopefully that works. Uh, one more question. And mm -hmm. is this function implemented in the Heroslin or is it uh, part of Visual Studio? Uh, the rename refactoring is part of Visual Studio using things from Roslyn. Okay. Um, the other refactoring I, I showed you before, the other refactorings I've showed you are completely, there's a framework that you can completely plug into where all you have to write is language, is, is tool agnostic. It could be plugged into other tools as well if they supported it. Emacs could use a ser this service and have refactorings in it, yes. Um, so, I mean, that's a promise at least, right? We don't, we have, nobody's actually built it for Emacs, I think, yet. But, uh, Oh, maybe they have. The OmniSharp guys have built quite a lot of this for quite a lot of different uh, editors. You should really go and visit the OmniSharp um, website if you're interested. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of room for improvement still, um, but it can definitely be done. Um, so I'm going to move away from this toy example, and I am going to now change uh, gear a little bit, and we, should, and we should implement one of these analyzers together, because that gives us a chance to kind of look at the Roslyn infrastructure and how it works, talk about how it works. Um, so what I did here is um, I actually, I, I went and started a new project. There's, there's actually a project template. If you go and say new project in Visual Studio um, and you install the right extensions for it, um, you can go and click on extensibility here. Once it wakes up, there we are. And I can do a standalone code analysis tool, or I can do an analyzer with code fix, which is what I've done here. I can build a refactoring, and it kind of comes with some, some uh, pre-built, some already working code out of the box that does something stupid, but shows you how to, how to get started. Okay, so I did that already, and I did clean it up and put the right things in. Um, but um, I actually have an empty 
implementation of the analyzer right here. So you see this method down here is empty. Um, so um, I, this, this uh, method here gets, gets registered up here as one of the actions that will analyze code. Um, and it, uh, it sort of registers with some kinds of, of uh, syntax nodes that it wants to get called with. So whenever um, the tool, whenever you do an edit and the tool analyzes the code, um, and there are if statements or else clauses in the code, this method will get called with an object representation of that. So that's what we're going to go and, um, and, and cause to happen. So when you, when you enter debug mode in one of these projects that are meant to build analyzers, the way it debugs is actually it launches Visual Studio, in a, a nested Visual Studio, and installs the, uh, the um, analyzer and code fix into that. It's a, it's a version that lives in its own hive, as we call it. Uh, it has its own settings. And so it can install, it, install its own extensions. So now I start a Visual Studio from Visual Studio. It's being debugged from the outer Visual Studio. And I'm going to open um, a piece of, uh, of just sample code here to talk about the fix we're going to build, which is um, so one of the ways that, that people are going to use analyzers is to rec use for style guidelines, right? So your company, in your company, um, it's a sin and a crime to have if statements or else clauses that aren't in curlies, where the body isn't in a curly. So we're going we're gonna to put a warning in to, to tell you, please put curlies around this. Um, and, um, and so that's one kind of analyzer that you might want to consider. I think the other one, possibly more important, is the, or equally important, is to wrap up analyzers with APIs that you're distributing um, that come along, that know about the APIs and help people use the APIs in the right way, saying, um, you should not use a constructor in this thing, you should call the create method, or you should not this and you should not that, so that you're guided to, with fixes and everything to use the API in the right way. We call that code aware libraries, where the library comes with its own guidance um, in, in shape of these analyzers. OK, let's get going here. We want to figure out, OK, we, we're going to be presented with some syntax nodes in a minute. What are those syntax nodes? Well, let's go and, and open the Roslyn syntax visualizer um, to have a bit of a look at this code here. So that's a little helpful tool. Comes in as an extension that you can just download off the gallery that, you know, when I click around in the code, I can see the tree structure of the code and the properties of, of the nodes there. I know it's a little tiny here, the font, but it says things like if keyword. And under the if keyword, there's some white space. And here's the if statement. And, and it kind of just, um, you can kind of navigate around the code and see what you have there. So we're definitely going to be looking at if statements where the expression inside of it the, that sits here, um, where it has curlies in it, which it currently does not. Um, so what does it look when it has curlies in it? Well, let's try and put some in and see how that, how that changes the tree over there. Um, we don't have that much screen real estate here in this resolution, but I'll do my best. Um, let's put a curly around this. And we now see that a block appears. So apparently, a thing with curlies around it is called a block. So we essentially, an analyzer is going to look, is there a block in, in the if statement? If not, um, give a squiggle, OK? And actually, if you want to get a, a, the, the, the full picture, um, pun intended, we can go in and view this as a graph. Um, so uh, here's. Here's, that, here's the block, for instance, as a syntax graph. You can go and look in Visual Studio. And, and that's how you learn about, you can look at before and after, and that's how you learn about what is the transformation I want to make, what are, what are the patterns I'm going to look for. So now I've done that. I'm ready to go and start writing my analyzer. Um, but one thing that's really annoying is that um, it took some time to start up this nested Visual Studio whenever I want to test what I'm doing. I don't want to wait for it to start up any time. So I'm going to write my code while I'm in the debugger. It's what's called edit and continue. We've had it for many years in Visual Studio. It's always sucked completely because it didn't know about new language features. And, and so there weren't a whole lot of edits you could actually do. That's been completely revamped now. It knows very many. It, it knows how to do most things that even make sense to compile and keep running. So we're just going to write the code um, while, we, um, while we're actually executing it. Uh, so I'm going to put a breakpoint in this empty method here. And I'm going, trigger, going, to, going to trigger a call to the node by going back to my test here and doing an edit. So let's just put a space somewhere um, there. And now it's analyzing the code because there was an edit. And so it saw my first if uh, statement. And it's going to come in here. We can see that the context that was passed in, it has a node, which is the syntax node I'm operating on. Um, and that node is an if statement syntax. So that's good. If we look in, uh, the if statement itself has a, 
Uh, it has a lot of stuff on it, so you, you can learn all kinds of things, including all kinds of nitty-gritty details, but one thing it does have is a statement that's the nested statement inside of the if, so that's the one we want to look at. Okay, but remember we can get called by both, uh, with both if statements and else clauses here. Um, so let's write some code to distinguish it. So um, let's, let's try to write the code for if statement. If statement is uh, context.node, that was the one that had the stuff in it, um, as if statement syntax, and it, it helps me complete here. Um, so now, down here, I will now get a, an if statement variable as well. You just can't see it because Oh, you can't see it yet because I haven't executed it. But let's go and move the instruction pointer. It's right over here. Let's move that, that right back up there and run again. And now um, we have an if statement as well down here because we ran it a little further in the code. Now we're just going to see if that if statement was actually null. If statement, well, if it's not null and If it's, um, if it's statement is not a block. And if statement.statement, that's a method to help me ask that question, uh, is kind of uh, syntax kind dot uh, block. So if it's not a block, not, then we should, that's when we should give it uh, a squiggle. That's when we should. Uh, warn that something's wrong with your code, right? Does that make sense? So we're just writing code over an ob uh, object model here. And um, uh, what are we going to do? Well, the only thing we really have to muck with is that context there, so hopefully it has something. It has a report diagnostic method. What a um, lucky thing. How do we get a diagnostic? Well, let's ask. It has a create method. Good. Uh, we need to pass in a descriptor. I cheated and, and put that uh, already in code uh, above. We need to decide where should where should the location of the squiggle be? Let's put a squiggle on the if keyword, right? So just that little keyword so it doesn't like span too much code and maybe uh, shadow other squiggles that you want to see. So why don't we take the if statement and get its if, uh, its if keyword and take the location of that. Is there something with location? Yeah, that's a get location method. Let's do that. All right, so now I created a, a diagnostic. Um, that was somewhat long, maybe we could take some of this and factor it out. With a refactoring, let's do a introduce local here. So it, it guesses that I'm looking for a location because the method was called get location. Um, yeah, so that's a good name, let's keep that. I'm doing all this editing while the program is running. Um, so now uh, let's go and remove the um, the breakpoint, drag the instruction pointer up to where we were. Oh, uh, I can't do that here. Did I do something wrong? I don't think I did. Let's just try, let's try to continue here. Um, and I'm, I'm back in my test program here, and you see that I get a squiggle on the first if statement. So it saw this did not have a, a block, and then I don't get a squiggle on the next one because it did have a block. And that's just, that's all it takes. Now I've written all the logic that it takes to now have um, the tool warn me about something. And then all we need to do, and I'm not going to do it here live, but all we need to do is to uh, write a fix that transforms the current code into the, into the uh, future code. And I'm going to, let's go look at that code, but not write it, because I don't want to confuse you too much. But you kind of get the idea, right? It's just an object model. Just poke around, ask questions, register a little here and there, and, and you quickly learn it. And now you can implement your company's style um, uh, guidelines. If you want to pester your coworkers with that, or you can um, put guidance on your APIs and so on. Does that make sense? OK. So I do want to say that this API is, is it's really supposed to be complete and efficient. And so we built all our IDE on top of it. There's no secret handshake or special language knowledge that our IDE has that isn't exposed in this API. Okay? So that is, um, that is how we know that it's good enough for, for uh, everyone to use. We build our own things on it. We could also build the else uh, logic. Uh, I don't want to probably bore you with, uh, with copying. It's going to be pretty much the same. But let's go and uh, actually, I already, so I said I already implemented the fix. So you can see here it says if statements and else clauses should use braces. Um, 
if I look at the fix here, it says add braces. Um, and it shows the diff here. So how did I get that diff? How did I get a before version and an after version? Um, well, let's go look at that. So now I add braces, it's going to add them there. Um, and if I had implemented it for else, it would also do that for the else, uh, else clauses. OK, so let's leave the debugging now. No, I don't want my changes. And go and look at, you can see there's a diagnostic analyzer here that I just built. And that's a code fix provider that um, is where the, the fix is. And there's some boilerplate. Um, but essentially, I'm writing a function here that digs into the, um, the that, that digs into the, fi tries to find out, okay, all it knows is where am I? I have a diagnostic, which diagnostic is it? Well, it's that, the one with that number, and which, what piece of code am I on? From that, we're going to find out, um, well, okay, okay, let's get uh, the root of the syntax tree for this document here, for the, the one we're viewing, uh, and that's a, a tool agnostic version of, of the, uh, the uh, document concept. Let's find the node that it is at the location that we put in the diagnostic when we put the squiggle. Let's find the, the syntax node that's there, and actually let's go, so that's the if keyword, and let's go find its parent, which is the if statement, okay? Actually, quick aside, um, if you have a, an immutable API that's based on sharing of, of large parts of your subtree, one of the things that you know is that a sub, so a subtree can't be, it can be part of multiple different trees at the same time. So it can't know what its parent is. It can't know what its location is that it represents in the source code because it can be in multiple, multiple ones of those. And the magic to be able to go to the parent anyway um, is, is kind of part of the cool architecture that's in here. And I can tell you after, that's more sort of algorithmic. But um, we go to the parent, um, we, um, we create a variable for the new node, and then we go into the if statement or the else clause case here. Um, because this, this is a, an immutable API, so we have to create a new, uh, a new world from the old world. We can't just um, mutate it. So what we do is we say, if it was an if statement, let's, uh, let's take the statement out of the if statement, create a block around it, and take that and replace Create a new if statement from the old one where we replace the block for the old thing that was there. Okay? So it's, that's kind of the construct a new thing from the old bits. Now we have a new if statement that has a block with it, the original expression inside. And then down here, we take the new node, we, we go to the root and we say replace the old node with the new node. We go to the document and it says replace the old, replace the old root with the new root. And then we return that new document. So what we did was create a new data structure from an old one. That's all we did. And then the whole infrastructure will compute the diff between the two and, and present the nice preview and all that based on that computation we did here. So that's kind of getting into the immutable programming style that we are um, very fond of. And why is it good that it's immutable? Well, uh, first of all, we're handing these trees out to all kinds of people who plug in. And we don't want them to mess them up. And we don't want to have shared mutable state or something. Um, we don't want people to be able to muck with the model. They can build their own, but they can't muck with the existing one. Um, and, um, but also, uh, in order to achieve part of the efficiency of also the batch compile, being able to parallelize a lot across you know, compiling different parts of the program becomes a lot easier when all the data structures involved are actually immutable. There's no risk. You don't have to lock anything. Right? You just take a snap snapshot of the universe, you compile that. Uh, if something changes or whatever, it's not your problem. Those are just other universes, but you're compiling this one. Okay. So immutable has turned out really well for us. It's been, a, it's been hard to optimize it to where it, it competes with a C++ program using uh, mutable structures, which is what we had before, but it's been worth it. Like once you get to a couple of cores, we're as efficient, we get faster uh, if you have more on batch compile um, because of this ability to parallelize. Okay. Um, that is probably what I wanted to show. So before I go and talk a little about um, the future, the, the next uh, um, installment of C Sharp and so on, I want to ask if there are any questions. You have any submitted? Yep. Adrian. The new node assignment. Oh, 
Um, new node is a local variable that I declared further up. Uh, let, oh, where, let's see, where is it? Right here. So I'm just saying, if I'm in the if case, assign the new, you know, transform the if node. If I'm in the else case, transform the else node. In either case, it's going to hold the new syntax node, uh, the new if or else clause. Um, and then the rest of the code is just shared to wire it into its right place in a new tree. Right. It, it's not obvious that they are. Wow, you guys are going to go do this right after the talk, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, would would we have a, a constant? Well, constant meaning read only. Yeah, the um, it, it, well, it, well, this this one is meant to be uh, read only. Actually, this one is this one is mutated later, but but uh, yeah, we could we could certainly add we could have var and val in the language, and that's one of the many many proposals that's there for the next version of the language. Yeah, we uh, we the, it, we don't have a notion of read only locals or parameters right now. Um, if we did, we already have the read-only keyword. We would probably let you put the read-only keyword on everything. And then in the case where it's read-only var, we would let you abbreviate that to val. How about that? That would be, be one way to approach it. Um, um, pull request. Um, ah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, there, there are definitely things that we, where we need to catch up. Um, any other questions on, on sort of the whole, the whole idea here? So again, um, the, the idea here is this code is now, the, the code that backs all this stuff, the whole Rosalind API um, is written in C Sharp, so it's going to run on all the places where .NET is going to run now. Um, and and it, the whole infrastructure should be pluggable into all IDEs um, as long as they have the right sort of UI hooks and the right extensibility, or the right infrastructure to hook that up um, underneath. Right. Charles. Uh, oh, you mean like a recursive loop, or? Well, I mean, it would essentially be a recursive loop if it's tail call optimized, or whatever, but basically be able to have this same uh, syntax tree structure, but be able to do a loop, actually do a loop. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I get the question. Okay, I'll, I can talk to you offline. Okay, let's, let's, do, let's do that one offline. Um, okay, want to talk a little bit about C-sharp 7? Um, so to do that, let's go, uh, let's go to GitHub. I'm going to do it in Chrome, OK? Chrome, Chrome is better with GitHub. Um, so you can laugh. Um, you, you are. You're sniggering. I can hear it. Well, just wait until Edge comes out. Um, so uh, all this stuff is up on, on uh, GitHub, right? And we, if you want to learn more about the language features, you go click here on the, on the README page. And here's the list of. OK. Internet in here, not so fast. I luckily pulled it up before. Um, uh, you can go look at an, that's an overview here of all the language features that went into C Sharp and VB this time around, C Sharp 6, VB 14, I believe. And if you want to double click on that, that's like a document about all the new language features here. So if you're interested in digging in more, just start there. Um, if you go to um, the issues on GitHub, um, here, is, here are issues sorted by or, filtered by labels saying um, area language design and feature request. So these are proposals that people, some of them are from my team, some of them are other people, have put up for new language features. Um, and I don't know why there's only 10 open there in one closed. Uh, this is definitely not the search I was looking for. Or I, I searched for something. Um, I, there's more. There's about 130. Um, I filtered it to too hard uh, at some point here. Um, so uh, there's definitely uh, proposals and discussions. Our, our C-sharp design process uh, involves meeting once or twice a week and, and 
and processing some of the proposals and having thoughts about them. And then I write up long notes. And I, instead of uh, sending those around just to, within the team, I put those up on GitHub. OK, so there, here are design notes. We started designing C Sharp. Whoa, we can zoom it too. How cool is that? I love Chrome. Um, um, the, we started in January, and there's already all this stuff up here. And so if you're really interested, go see what we discussed. And um, in particular, there's, I recently put up sort of an overview of the features we've looked at so far and what we thought about them. So if I click on that, um, you know, there'll be a list here of some things that uh, we rejected, some things that we haven't really decided on yet, some things that we think really have legs. So on here, you'll see things like tuples, pattern matching, records or algebraic data types, nullability tracking, the ability to have uh, um, the type system help with whether reference, references are null or not. Um, async streams, maybe some of you saw the talk earlier today about, um, about reactive programming. Uh, definitely, I mean, we, a lot of the problems in that talk uh, were not really problems if you were in C Sharp. I want to say un unmodestly, there was, there were Java, because Java doesn't have async. But we only have support for single asynchronous results. And uh, having support for streams as well in a language would probably be a good next step. So we're considering that as well. And then there are several things here. All of these are juicy things. It's just like deciding what to go for and whatnot. And our team is still finishing up building the previous uh, version. So we're still just playing with ideas. We'll start soon, hopefully, be able to put some prototypes together. Maybe some people in the community will also prototype language features and, and just have a, um, an environment where people can try out, well, how does this version feel like? And very sort of just hacked up rough prototypes and, and um, get feedback on that. So some of the, some of the features that, um, that we considered there, I do have slides for, which I accidentally showed you before. Um, so uh, let's go and look at tuples, for instance. The thing that we're thinking about for tuples is that the core problem to solve with tuples is having multiple results out of, out of functions, out of methods. And so we would have a syntax that's very similar to uh, parameter lists. It's just going the other way. And that means tuples would have, they would have types for each component, but they would also have names. And you could use those names if you want to at the consumption side to get at, to know, OK, I got three ints. Which one is the sum and which one is the count and which one is the, uh, to know what you're getting back and to uh, be able to access them through that. Um, we would have tuple construction and probably deconstruction as well. Um, so kind of standard stuff, um, but um, would be very useful to have in, uh, in C Sharp. And we kind of fit in nicely, I think, syntactically. It doesn't really stick out too much. One of the more crazy things that I'm still eager to see if we can land is after having had six versions of the language where you cannot distinguish in any way between uh, references to objects that can be null and ones that can't, can we go and retrofit that in in a natural way into the language and get some benefit from it in saying, OK, first and last name have to be there. String is nullable, so it doesn't have to. So if I dot into them, um, it's fine to dot into the, the not so nullable ones, but it's not fine to dot into the one that's nullable. You have to check for null first. OK, so that's one kind of warning that you want to get to find bugs in your code. The other one, the other direction, you would do things like making sure that um, the, um, the things that are non-nullable actually get initialized to a non-null value, that you don't just leave them hanging with a default value of null. The problem in .NET is everything can be null. Every, every reference can be null. And we can't go fix that retroactively. If, if we try that ambition, we, we would just fail. But what we can do is we can express intent, and we can give you guidance and bugs or warnings wherever you are going against the expressed intent. That we can probably do. And so if that's our level of ambition, maybe we can help Tony Hoare, you know, old uh, theoretical computer scientist, he always said, and not so theoretical, he said, null uh, pointers were my billion dollar mistake. And so our ambition is to get him back probably about half of that billion. Like, it, it wouldn't like, totally eradicate the problem like some languages do, but it would be definitely better. So that's all I have to show um, and have to share. And I think we're probably out of time. We took some questions along the way. Um, is, what do you say? Are we, are we done? Are we, are any, any last questions? OK. Immutable what, sorry? You mentioned that uh, Rotary is using like, immutable switch switch parameters. Yes, I'll tell you after. I'll tell you offline. Uh, that's a good, uh, it's a good com uh, you know, conversation topic for the party tonight. If you don't know what to talk about, you know, just ask me about that. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>